Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Roosevelt House. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as the director here uh, on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the, the opening of our newest exhibition. Um, I want to acknowledge um, among our guests tonight, and I'm going to pepper the names throughout my introduction, but two of our um, advisory board members are here, uh, Dorothy Samuels and our newest board of advisors member, Tony Stepanski, so I want to welcome them. Um, the show we're opening tonight, which adds to our recent and growing roster of exhibitions at the house, um, an ongoing program we're now deeply committed to. This one is a particularly special show because it, it presents not only a retrospective look at an amazing aspect of the Roosevelt presidency, but because it presents new scholarship and a new accounting of an extraordinary government program that so ingeniously combined the ideals of economic recovery with vital and enduring artistic uh, and cultural creativity. The evidence of which, as we've learned from uh, the Living New Deal Project, abounds right here in New York just to a staggering degree from murals at Harlem Hospital and LaGuardia Airport, and countless post offices and hospitals to neighborhood swimming pools, public housing, the Triborough Bridge, the aptly named FDR Drive, zoos, uh, improvements to Central Park, Bryant Park, 300, 300 playgrounds in New York City, and on and on, and just an extraordinary burst of energy, creativity, and enduring architectural impact on New York. Once again, for our exhibition, we are indebted to the Stepanski Family Charitable Trust for the generous grant that made this installation possible. So Tony, again, thank you very much. And uh, to Roosevelt House uh, curator, historian, Deborah Gardner for conceiving and writing it. Deborah, stand up, please. Thank you. I told Deborah that uh, it, from my Metropolitan Museum days that curators did one exhibition every six years on average. <laughs> Deborah does six exhibitions every year. So, well, in two years, and she's amazing. And I want to thank um, Danny Culkin for designing it. He's gonna, he can do a Peronist wave from the balcony there. Dan, Danny's filming tonight, but he's our designer. So where and how did this originate? Um, well, it's very simple. We learned last year from Richard Walker, director of the Living New Deal Project, that, uh, which is dedicated to preserving and publicizing the programs of the New Deal all over the country, that it was planning to publish a map of New Deal sites in New York City. And we pounced with his sufferance. Um, there is no more perfect place to celebrate its publication or any aspect of the New Deal, we think, than here at Roosevelt House. After all, it was during the interregnum between FDR's election to the presidency in November 1932 and his inauguration in March 33 that planning for the New Deal was initiated here at the house. Right upstairs in the library on the second floor, FDR met with academics and cabinet designees who would go on to shape and manage New Deal programs. Harold Ickes offered the job of Secretary of the Interior, here we think, would go on to oversee both the Works Progress Administration, which provided the funding to employ millions of people on New Deal project, as well as the Public Works Administration, which paid for the construction costs. Francis Perkins arrived here to receive an offer to serve as Secretary of Labor, moreover, to become the first woman to serve in any presidential cabinet when she said she would accept only if she could draw up plans for what became Social Security, bless you, Francis Perkins, um, and unemployment compensation, FDR, as was his want, said, sure, why not? Um, Chris Bryseth is here, who knew Frances Perkins from her 
days in the, at Cornell in the 60s and is now the, the chair of the Francis Perkins Center. So welcome, Chris. Good to see you. <laughs> Harry Hopkins, who, like Perkins, had served under FDR in Albany uh, to create a temporary emergency relief administration to help the unemployed in New York, also received an offer to go to Washington here and to set up the program on a national scale. And the result was the WPA. One of its components was the Federal Arts Project, which employed painters, writers, theater people, and others in creative fields. And you see evidence of that upstairs as Deborah has installed them books and posters, murals, et cetera. And of course, of them, Hopkins famously said, of artists, hell, they've got to eat just like other people. Um, and the result was the serious commitment that we know about. We're so pleased that joining us tonight is the great-grandson of Harry Hopkins, so please welcome David Giffen. <laughs> um, this is the perfect moment to acknowledge also the Living New Deal group. Um, Gary Brecken, founder and board member, Harvey Smith, board member, Susanna Ives, communications director, and Richard Walker, the director, from you, whom you will be hearing a little bit later when he officially unveils and describes the New Deal map, many copies of which, by the way, which are amazing, will be available at the reception that will follow tonight's program. So the story here is, is very simple, really, and timeless. As we know and appreciate, FDR believed in the fundamental importance of giving people the opportunity to work. Accepting one of his four Democratic nominations, he told the convention, liberty requires opportunity to make a living, a living decent according to the standards of the time, a living which gives man not only enough to live by, but something to live for. That's what the New Deal gave Americans, including New Yorkers, the opportunity to survive and work with dignity and to supply an abundance of creativity in return. And now, inspired by the Living New Deal project, we have a tangible guide that accounts for the permanent impact of these programs on the cityscape we call home. And that's why we wanted to amplify the map with an exhibition where you'll see samples from so many of the programs in architecture, housing, and healthcare, education, and the arts, and of course, the theater. Uh, and if you choose to visit our own favorite WPA project, the North Building of Hunter College, you can just walk a few blocks <coughs> east and, and north of here. Um, for the opening night, we wanted not just a celebration, which this evening certainly is, but a valuable learning experience too. So we also invited a panel of experts to talk about the legacy of the New Deal. Um, so many of its public works reshaped the city as they will be discussing. So many of its programs continue to feed and clothe and sustain people. Um, and on that note, we can welcome another of our um, advisory board members and one of the great Roosevelt advocates in the United States, Bill Vanden Heuvel. Ambassador, welcome. <laughs> So I'm thrilled that our panelists can be here. They'll be introduced momentarily, but I have to do a special shout out to the fourth member of our advisory board who's here and will be participating, um, Ira Katznelson. So welcome, Ira. <laughs> and also to a, a, a very good friend and frankly, a lifelong idol. And everywhere I've, to several people I've spoken to tonight, they all say, D I read Luxembourg in high school. I read Luxembourg in my freshman year of college. And we're not young. <laughs> um, one of the great Roosevelt and presidential historians of the past half century and an ongoing inspiration. I always say when I grow up, I want to be just like Professor William Luxembourg. So Bill, <laughs> welcome. So now to get the program underway, I want to turn the program over to our Moderator, um, please join me in welcoming Hunter College's respected professor of urban affairs and planning, Owen Gutfreund. Owen. Thank you, Harold. Um, 
when Deborah first contacted me about participating in this, uh, this celebration and this event, um, I was, of course, happy to do it. I have uh, spent many years as a scholar of New York history and the built environment and uh, thinking about how cities take, took shape in the 20th century. So this, is, uh, this is, seemed like in the middle of my wheelhouse, and I said, great, who's on the panel? And then she gave me the rundown. And of course, I simultaneously thought, that's even better. And boy, that's a little bit intimidating. Um, and, and one of the reasons why is, in a, in a different way, I have a personal connection to each of the panelists today. Um, first of all, I will say I was one of those people that said that about uh, Bill Luchtenberg. Um, but it was in high school when I read The Perils of Prosperity, uh, which next year will be 60 the 60th anniversary of the publication of that book. And it is still in print, and it still sells well on Amazon, and it's still used in classrooms. And, but for me, when I was 17 years old, reading it in an in a AP US history class in high school, it was the book that helped me see that history wasn't what textbooks showed us of names and dates and memorization. History was stories about change and stories about the people that affected change. And, and the different trajectories of nations and groups of people. And it was that moment when I had a sense of what history could be and what a good history book could be. And I had no idea when I was 17, but I ended up getting a PhD in American history and, and becoming a history professor. And it had a lot to do with that moment reading that book, um, not 60 years ago, but a little while ago. <laughs> um, and then when I was in, when I was in college, uh, I had the, uh, the also in an introductory American politics course, I read one of Ira Katz Nelson's first book, City Trenches, and uh, it, it absolutely changed the way I thought about urban politics. And I now teach urban policy and urban planning always from an historical perspective. And the idea that you need to combine multiple disciplines and see these issues not just from the scale of government, but from the scale of the participants and the affected, um, I, I really trace right back to having read Ira's book. And uh, Marta Gutman, uh, an esteemed professor of uh, really of the built environment uh, at City College, is somebody who I've been able to grow up with as a scholar, and we keep running into each other at various events, and I've learned so much from her own work, the most recent one of which was, I'm not going into long introductions for people that don't need introductions, so I'm just going to say the most recent book that Marta published uh, uh, des deservingly won the Kenneth Jackson Prize for the best book in North American urban history from the Urban History Association, and that really was looking not at New York, at Oakland, but still, again, at these spaces that were built for people to experience the city, and she'll tell you a little bit about how that connects to the New Deal. So I have a, feel like I have a personal connection to each of them, but um, I'm not going to talk very much more because I really want to turn over. The structure for the evening is that each of them will be given uh, 10 or 12 minutes to say a little bit about the New Deal, and, uh, and then um, I'm going to ask them to make connections to each other, and I'm going to moderate a discussion amongst the, the four of us, and then at the end we'll have time for some questions from the audience. The one thing I do want to say to frame this, and in particular um, Dick Walker, who I'm going to introduce next, uh, Dick Walker is the driving force behind this Living New Deal project. And uh, that may be how you know of him, but there's another way that I know of him also. Here we are at Hunter College, which I think is thriving and building centers of excellence like Roosevelt House uh, a, as a public higher education institution. But uh, that's a tough slog in today's world. And Dick spent uh, most of his career, I mean, perhaps all of his career, I'm not sure, uh, in the geography department at the University of California, Berkeley. And there's no question that there was a moment, and it was a long moment, when UC Berkeley was the absolute emblem of what public higher education could be. Um, multiple star departments, uh, and one of those was geography. And uh, the, the, in the political environment that we live in today, uh, it's very hard to sustain that, and it's been very hard in California. And it's been, um, at, it, at the distance of coast to coast, it's been a loss for all of us in academia and in this country to watch as department after department at UC Berkeley end up being diminished. And the geography department, which was uh, such a, a luminary department, certainly uh, was diminished uh, um, when Dick Walker retired because it doesn't seem likely that it's going to be uh, invested in in the same way that it once was. Um, 
sorry for that little screed there. But anyway, um, it, it's uh, the thing I want to say about the New Deal uh, to frame this, and then I'll turn this over to Dick, is that the New Deal has become a symbol of, for most Americans, it's a symbol of scale and scope of government. And they, they, there, was a mo there was a time when government tried to do a lot on a large scale and a lot of different things, and a lot of it succeeded, and, uh, and it, uh, uh, in varying ways and to varying extents, helped us uh, bounce back from the Great Depression. Um, but that's become the very simple understanding people have of it. And it's, its impact today isn't just about what government can and should do and how big should government be, although that's become, it's become a, a code word for that. Everywhere Americans live their lives, they are surrounded by the New Deal. They are surrounded by the things done by the New Deal, the things left by the New Deal, and that's what, to me, is so inspiring about this project that Dick is going to share with us, is that um, it, it's, it isn't something that happened. It is something that is continuing to happen all around us, and everybody's lives continue to be affected by the New Deal. Um, regardless of what happens with contemporary public policy. So uh, Dick's uh, project with Gray Brecken to unearth that, to map it, to make sure that Americans can be aware through vehicles like this map of that legacy is something that I'm very happy to celebrate with him. So I'm going to turn it over to Dick, and then Bill Luchtenberg, and then Marta Gutman, and then Ira Katz-Nelson, and then we'll have a discussion. Dick? Well, there's not much to say after that. I, I think it's all been said. Thank you, Owen. That was very kind. And uh, thanks to Hal Holzer and Deborah Gardner, Bill Goldstein, for setting this up, at this event up, and doing that magnificent display. It's really fantastic. Um, I do want to acknowledge our, we have a couple of our board members of the Living New Deal on hand, Bill Luckenberg and Ira Cass Nelson. We have Frank Roosevelt as well. We have... Um, research board member Sheila Collins, I think Sharon and Musher is here too, and uh, some of our team besides Gray Brecken, our founder, we have Susan Ives and Harvey Smith, and and we're very we have a big kind of uh, group. There's a central team in the Bay Area, but we have people all over the country, and the idea of the Living New Deal, which was started 10 years ago or so by Gray Brecken was to uncover this hidden landscape of the New Deal that simply had disappeared. It's kind of like going to the Yucatan Peninsula and uncovering Mayan ruins, which, as you know, they just keep finding more and more and more of them. And we started out, you know, just around California. We thought, OK, well, we'll just do this in California and see what we can find. And very quickly, you realize that there's hundreds and thousands just in your own state. And then there's the rest of the country. So we went national about five years ago, and the pro project has just expanded and snowballed since then. We now we have an, a very nice website and a map. So we have a documentation of these sites, and then a map. You can go and look at our map and find any of these sites anywhere in the United States. And we have over 13, around 13,000 of them mapped now. The problem is there's at least 100,000 more because the New Deal was everywhere. And when you start looking, uh, it's this fantastic scavenger hunt, and you can't believe what's out there, most of which is not marked, most of which is forgotten, unless you go find the local librarian or head of the local historical society or dig up some obscure tract of local history, you suddenly discover this stuff is everywhere. And uh, that's our job is to uncover it and to get it up there in a public forum so that people can find it, they can look for things, um, and then they can also find out more about the New Deal. So not only do we have this fantastic online map, uh, we are a center for news, a uh, clearinghouse for information. We have, we're sort of the Wikipedia of the New Deal now, I think. We have uh, uh, little introductions to all the programs uh, did you know there were over 60 New Deal programs? We usually think, oh, well, that's CCC, WPA, and two others, and then we can run out of fingers. But it's an incredible uh, array and richness 
that even I thought I kind of knew because my parents, I got to stop doing that. My parents were new dealers. Uh, my dad's first job was with the National Resources Planning Board. So I kind of feel like I've come back home, uh, sort of uh, put the bookend on the on a lifetime of walkers and the New Deal. Anyway, uh, we also have events like this back in, in, around the country, especially, of course, in the Bay Area. And we welcome comments. Uh, people contribute uh, sites to us. And it's quite, it's quite a uh, crowdsourced uh, participatory project, though we do, we do keep uh, track of the, uh, we have quality control to make sure that not anything goes up there. Um, and of course, the point of this is partly to preserve this, reveal this legacy, help preserve it and mark it, but it's an educational project to make sure people uh, know what the New Deal did. Uh, and um, a project, you know, it is a project that's trying to inform Americans about what was done. And we're sort of the material evidence that we're gathering, we feel, is an essential kind of uh, basis for making claims about what good government can do, even under adverse circumstances, when it serves all the people and all the country. This stuff is everywhere. And there are all kinds of people all the way down. Now, then we decided not just being online, OK, that's cool today. But I guess I'm an old-fashioned guy, and some of us are. So we thought, when we speak of material culture, that this is the kind of material culture that can do a lot of good. That it's tangible, it's, uh, it's visible, and by the way, it's kind of beautiful, too, if I do say so myself. So you all have one of these on your chairs, on your seats. And I'm very, very proud of how beautifully it came out. And we feature, there are 775 sites on here. And of course, there are hundreds more that we haven't documented yet. So if any of you want to go out and document more sites in New York, please do and tell us. And then we feature 50 sites. We have a little walking tour maps at the bottom. And then we have those 50 sites, we have information on them. And 20 of them are mural sites that are featured at the bottom. Anyway, that's what it is. Uh, you can find out more about that. You can look at it for yourself. Um, we plan, we do more things, and next year we're going to start on a map of New Deal Washington. Because what better place to show all those conservatives <laughs> that they're sitting and working in a New Deal city? And, and yeah. So uh, we have more ideas about Na National New Deal Preservation Conference um, and more on the research possibilities. This stuff is never, was never a set. No one at the end of the New Deal said, oh, let's make a list of all the projects. It was never done. So stuff's all hidden in national archives, local archives, newspapers. It's a fantastic treasure hunt. If any of you want to help us, we appreciate that. If anybody wants to support us, we appreciate that too. Uh, these things, one of the things we're going to do is we want to get these maps into the hands of all the social studies teachers in New York. So that ain't cheap. But we'll do it if you, anybody wants to help us. Uh, that's what we're investing in. And ultimately, we'd love to create a New Deal museum for all these kind of artifacts. Anyway, I've gone on too long. Thank you again. Thank you for being here. So uh, now uh, it gives me great pleasure to ask Bill Lichtenberg, the William Rand Keenan Jr. Professor Emeritus of History at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill to come say a few words about this project. Thank you very much. Nearly 40 years ago, I, uh, I, um, one morning in North Carolina, I saw across a crowded room uh, a young woman who is with me uh, uh, tonight, and uh, 
I have, we have a favorite family story about the perils of prosperity about which such nice things have been uh, said this evening. Uh, Jean Ann came up to me and said, oh, I know who you are. You're the man who wrote that book, The Perils of Prosperity, that I was assigned in college and never finished. <laughs> and with that wonderful uh, beginning, we've lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> in December 2001, I flew to Moscow on a U.S. delegation to meet with Russian leaders. We were told that they did not want to return to the total government control that had been so terrible in the Stalin era, but that they were also unwilling to go cold turkey into a free market economy. The American New Deal of the 1930s interested them as a possible halfway house. And we were asked to tell them what the New Deal had done. When on the first afternoon in Moscow, I walked into the lobby of our hotel, I was met by the American organizer of the conference. From the look on his face, I immediately sensed something was very wrong. Quickly, he broke the bad news. The keynote speaker, who was to open the gathering, he told me, had canceled. After a pause to let that unhappy development sink in, he went on, you are going to have to be the keynote speaker. <laughs> I was stunned. I had no notes with me, no books. What to do? When early on a December morning, in a time when it never stopped snowing, the Russians, including members of the Duma, the Russian parliament, assembled for the opening session in a spacious assembly hall. I decided when I rose to speak to take them on a figurative journey across the United States in order to convey to them the extent of the New Deal. Drawing on memory, I explained that if they were at LaGuardia Airport in New York City, cross the Triborough Bridge into Manhattan, rode down the FDR Drive, and left the city through the Lincoln Tunnel, all four were legacies of the New Deal. I then led them west across the country, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, the Cleveland Airport, the Chicago Subway, the Shelter Belt in the Great Plains, all the way west to the Pacific Coast, to the Oregon Coastal Highway that skirts the surf, the beautifully crafted Timberline Lodge on snow-clad Mount Hood, buildings on the campus of the University of Washington in Seattle, the huge dams at Bonneville and Grand Coulee, even the San Francisco Zoo. All, all, and as Dick just said, many, many thousands more built by the New Deal, most of them in little more than a half dozen years. Alternatively, 
European travelers, I said, might prefer a more southerly route down the Skyline Drive and the Blue Ridge Parkway, through the great dams and lakes of the Tennessee Valley Authority, a region four-fifths the size of England, on to the Orange Bowl and the overseas highway to Key West, then west through the Gulf states to Charity Hospital in New Orleans and the Vieux Carré remodeled French market, the football stadiums of Ole Miss and LSU, the vibrant river walk in San Antonio, the restored cliff dwellings at Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico, and hundreds of miles farther to the west, the highways and bridges of Los Angeles. I was able to deliver the keynote address in Moscow from memory for two reasons. One is that as a boy growing up in New York, borough of Queens, I was keenly aware of how the New Deal was transforming the American landscape. On any number of occasions, when I was in an adventurous mood, I would start out from my home in Winfield and walk mile after mile to be able to see a river, the East River, in the northernmost reaches of Queens in Astoria. where there was a small landing field at a spot called North Beach. Uh, we talked of it more familiarly as Bear Ass Beach. <laughs> when uh, Roosevelt in his second inaugural spoke of the ill-clad uh, to whom uh, he wanted to extend help. I don't think he had in mind <laughs> the scene I would see uh, in the East River in Astoria, but ill-clad they surely were. And I watched with lively interest that small field transmuted by the WPA into LaGuardia Airport. A PWA project was even more exciting. On a July day in 1936, when I was 13, I, I'll save you uh, trying to figure out the mathematics <laughs> of all this, I'm 94. Uh, I became the first person to walk across the Triborough Bridge from Queens to the Bronx and back again. The uh, first New York play I ever saw when I was 14 was Power, produced by the Federal Theater at the Ritz on West 48th Street, just off Broadway. A ticket cost me a quarter. And one summer night in a park in my neighborhood in Queens, where I would go roller skating. A huge van pulled up, and the sides of the van opened into a stage. And there, uh, for the first time in my life, thanks to the Federal Theater, I saw Shakespeare perform. In the summer of 1939, I was 16. 
I just graduated from a Mammoth High School in Queens, and I had my heart set on going to Cornell. But tuition at Cornell was $400 a year. That seems such a trivial sum today, but it was a great deal more money than my family with the best will in the world could come up with. Early in August, I returned from a brief family vacation on my grandparents' farm to find the mailbox, which rarely had anything in it but bills, bulging with congratulatory letters from my high school teachers. Out of one envelope fell a newspaper clipping announcing that I had won a New York State Regent Scholarship of $100 a year in tuition for four years. Out of another tumbled a clipping saying I had also won a Cornell Scholarship of $200 a year for four years. Overnight, I had $300 of the $400 I needed. But if I did not come up with the remaining $100, I would never see the campus far above Cayuga's waters. So though it was already late summer, and in 1939, work was hard to get, I found a job wheeling a good humor ice cream cart through the streets of Sunnyside. Pardon me. Unhappily, a good humor costs twice as much as any other ice cream bar. And in this 10th year of the Great Depression, most people could not afford them. Day after day, I peddled my cart from early morning until after dark only to find I was little nearer my goal. When I returned, my ice cream compartment was almost as full as when I'd started out, with registration in Ithaca only a few weeks away. Then, one stifling day, uh, a man who drove a good humor truck kindly went out of his way to let me know that on the farthest reach of town, there was a huge, hot, and hungry crowd because President Roosevelt was expected to dedicate an extension of Queens Boulevard, another New Deal public works project. I pedaled, pedaled, pedaled my bike more than 20 blocks, and when I got to the site, I was able to sell every ice cream bar in my sizable cart. That day's sale gave me just enough additional money to pay the Cornell tuition. And on a memorable September morning, I set off for Ithaca. I might add, uh, so glad to see Harold Holzer here uh, today. Uh, he and I were once in Albany where I was commissioned to uh, uh, do an interview that would be published in American Heritage with Governor Cuomo, Governor Mario Cuomo. Uh, and uh, in the course of this, I said to him, now you and I were both raised in Queens. And he shouted back, sunny side, sunny side meaning he had read uh, this account in the preface of uh, one of my books. And then he said, you know, I never believed that story. You must have had coke, meaning cocaine, <laughs> in that, uh, in that uh, box. But no, it, it, it's a true story. There's a second reason I was able to deliver the keynote in Moscow from memory. 
that I had written about the New Deal public works projects in several books. I also benefited from a PhD dissertation I directed at Columbia by Barbara Blumberg on the WPA in New York City. She made me aware of the enormous scale of activity. The budget of the WPA for New York City alone, she points out, was greater than the entire budget of the US War Department. I realize today that despite this background, I would have been much better equipped to speak if I had had the extraordinary resources of the Living New Deal that have become accessible since that time. Over the past two years, I've been printing out on my computer hundreds upon hundreds I'm sure well over a thousand pages from the Living New Deal sites, state by state, city by city, and have been astonished and impressed by how much I've learned for the first time. Despite having written eight books on the Roosevelt era, I, like millions of other Americans, have been living among New Deal legacies without being aware of them. The Living New Deal has, in its account of New York State, fascinating accounts of the school in Dobbs Ferry attended by my three sons during the years I lived in Westchester County and was teaching for 30 years at Columbia, and of the post office in the town from which I mailed manuscripts of books. Both buildings constructed by the New Deal. It alerted me too to the park in the small community of Connersville, Indiana, where my wife was born. For many years, Jean Ann and I, avid birders, have made a point on our many long drives from North Carolina to New England of stopping at our two favorite bird sanctuaries, Bombay Hook in Delaware, Hammonasset Beach in Connecticut. And both of these I've learned from the Living New Deal and did not know before were created by Roosevelt agencies. I look forward eagerly in the days to come to carrying this new map of the Living New Deal with me on new explorations of the city where I was born and in which for many years I lived. We all owe a very great debt to the Living New Deal for the outstand outstanding work it has been doing and is doing. Thank you all. So uh, what I just, before I introduce Marta, um, boy, if we could uh, all be able to do what Bill Lichtenberg does and just did when we're on the other side of 90. How awesome is that? <laughs> Our next panelist is going to be Marta Gutman, Professor of Architecture and Urban History at City College. Uh, Marta, you're up.
So uh, Owen asked me to speak about the built environment, but I think you've already learned all you need to know. <laughs> so I, I'll try to um, add to the words of the wonderful words we've just heard. I'm very honored to be here this evening, uh, sharing the stage with such uh, such lumin luminous scholars, uh, people whom I've admired um, both from close and afar for for many many years and. I wanted uh, to thank especially Owen for inviting me to participate, and Owen, whom we've, uh, as we have grown up together as scholars, for sure, and we came to know each other very well uh, through a project that a colleague of ours, Hilary Ballin, who alas cannot be here tonight due to her uh, ill health, invited us to participate in, and that project was called Robert Moses in the Modern City. You may have seen some of the, uh, 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 extraordinary exhibits that dotted New York, that were appeared in New York about 10 years ago, and that um, that did document the effect of the New Deal in at least some of them on New York City's landscape. I, I also wanted to thank Gray Brecken. I thought this was also going to be an absentia, but <laughs> but I'm so glad he's here. And and Gray, uh, who authored the Living New Deal project, who imagined it. Uh, I was privileged to walk through one of the Moses exhibits with Gray uh, that, the, that about a decade ago. And as we walked through the exhibit, I heard Gray say again and again to me, New Deal, New Deal, WPA, WPA. And, and he, I, I'll, I'll be courteous and say gently nudged me <laughs> to say that the, um, that the, uh, that the captions were, were amended. So, and then of course there's Dick Walker, uh, who has uh, brought all of this to life with this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful new map. So I want to talk about the map. That's my one of my goals here this evening. And I have to say that I'm I'm so delighted that we're here to celebrate the publication of this map, uh, New Deal, New York, and 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 do look and I and I will point out sites on this map that I think are important for you to know about. It's not just any map. Um, but a document that highlights the triumph of liberal democracy in the 1930s, a time when the forces of reaction believed the liberal state was doomed. And no one has explained this better than Ira Katznelson has in his book, Fear Itself. So New Deal New York does this by revealing the enduring legacy of New Deal liberalism on the built environment, recording and exposing what I like to think uh, of as the public landscape of the New Deal in New York City. And I would, would like to thank especially uh, uh, Dick Walker for the fact that there are two editions of this map, a digital edition that you can study online and a print edition that we can carry with us and hold in our hands to guide our exploration of the city and its New Deal history. And I just would say Explore we must, because there is so much to learn. I thought I grasped the scope of the New Deal legacy in our city, a city that benefited so much from FDR's lar largesse that it was known colloquially as the 51st state. Uh, but I gasped when I saw the map and realized that almost a 1,000 sites are depicted. And to help us navigate this vast quantity of stuff, 30 examples of major New Deal public works uh, public works projects are highlighted on the map, 20 notable murals are singled out, and walkable sites in downtown Manhattan, Central Park, and Midtown are identified. So you can take your own curated tours, thanks to, thanks to Dick's, uh, Dick's work on uh, selecting them. Yes, sites in Manhattan dominate, but and as the map makes very, very clear, the democratizing legacy of the New Deal lives on in all of the five boroughs in infrastructure, artwork, schools, parks, recreation facilities, and other public buildings that continue to enhance the everyday lives of New Yorkers, serving needs from the mundane to the aspirational. And so I would also want to remind us that we as New Yorkers have three politicians to thank. The President, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Mayor, Fiorella LaGuardia, and the infamous Parks Commissioner, Robert Moses. So, to, with one third of the nation's entire workforce unemployed when he took office in 1933, FDR quickly put in place several work relief programs intending to put 3.5 million people back to work in two years' time. 
And prime among them was the Works Progress Administration, which Professor Luchtenberg has already mentioned, authorized by Roosevelt in 1935 to, quote, carry on small useful projects designed to ensure, assure a maximum employment in all localities, close quote. No city matched New York in dollars received for this program. And in the scope of ensuing construction, Mayor LaGuardia won for the nation's biggest city special status in the WPA's administrative framework and propelled, propelled by Moses's iron will and administrative genius, the city proceeded to take in one seventh of all expenditures made by the WPA in 1935 and 1936. And Moses, it's an enormous amount of money, right? Moses directed most of the funding to the Department of Parks, spending in the first two years some $113 million on parks and recreation alone. So a building, the building frenzy that ensued, uh, uh, a, building, I would, a building frenzy ensued, and in part because no one knew how long Congress would continue to subsidize the public works program, and so the mandate was to build fast, right, to use the money. And the government took direct steps to ensure that New Yorkers knew it was working for them. Contractors were required to place on each construction site a small sign that stated USA work program, WPA, and sometimes the specific project was mentioned. The words were imprinted on a red, white, and blue banner and decorated with stars, just in case you didn't get the nation building attention. <laughs> when the project was finished, the temporary sign was replaced with a permanent one, a bronze medallion affixed to the facade stated that it had been built by the Works Progress Administration, 1935 to 1939. And that bronze medallion uh, was decorated with the American Eagle and with stars. So New, Do New Deal New York shows us the map, how thoroughly the WPA and a host of other funding programs transformed New York City. And I've studied one of the projects that LaGuardia and Moses invested in immediately and conspicuously, the extraordinary public swimming pools, uh, swimming pool complexes that were built in each borough. At first, they commissioned 11 new pools and bathhouses at a cost of about a million dollars each, and several others were added subsequently. Heralded as grand new spaces of public informality, dedicated in particular at the city's children, the public pools, as the editors of Fortune magazine pointed out, were a conspicuous example of the social dividend promised by the New Deal. Each site opened one by one during the hot summer of 1936, and the weather collaborated beautifully. Uh, and thousands of men and women attended the opening ceremonies, which were brilliantly orchestrated by Moses and LaGuardia. By Labor Day, when the pools closed, 1,650,000 people had used the facilities in the first year alone. So all of the WPA pools continued to serve uh, New Yorkers, every one of them. And thank goodness, two are highlighted on the New Deal New York map. And you can look on your map and see Astoria Park Pool, Site 18, and Red Hook Recreation Center, which is uh, uh, um, acknowledged by a wonderful photo of two children standing on broad ledges in the pool, ledges that were, were known by the term scum gutters and designed to keep the water clean and swimmers healthy, a very big, big goal of Robert Moses. So the kids are posing for the photographer, Arthur Rothstein, who was himself working for the government. And Rothstein, employed by the Farm Security Administration and other federal agencies in the 1930s and early 40s, documented impoverished areas of our country to build support for federal intervention. And he recorded the ensuing programs uh, to spread the word about the successes of New Deal liberalism. Well, it's very likely that the two children learned to swim in Red Hook Pool. And thanks to funding from the WPA, the Parks Department ran a Learn to Swim program that benefited all New York City children, regardless of race, ethnicity, or gender. Now, I've written about the poster that promoted the program, and the artist, of course, was hired through the WPA, and uh, it is a poster that some historians have argued depicts the color line that segregated pools under Moses' regi regime. I've argued that while the color line did run through pools and parks that were built in the city's segregated neighborhoods, it didn't run through all of them. 
New Yorkers did test the entrenched racism, did, te did test entrenched racism during the New Deal, and they did defeat it in our city in certain and specific sites. And here's one example. The 1936 Olympic trials were held at the, in the stadium at Randall's Island Park, which is site 16 on your map, uh, across the river from Astoria Park Pool, uh, and under the shadow of the Triborough Bridge, which we've already heard mentioned. So the young uh, Jesse Owens competed, and it came as no surprise that the gifted African-American athlete qualified and went on to sweep the track and field events at the Berlin Olympics. Adolf Hitler sat in the grandstand, smack in the middle of a grandiose stadium that was decorated with enormous Nazi insignia, and he watched Owens race and win again and again, and his victories uh, belying the racist, racist ideologies that it would take a world war to defeat. So as you use the New Deal New York map to explore the living legacy of the New Deal in our city, Keep in mind, I urge you to keep in mind the extraordinary challenges that all involved face. Face the need to build fast, to repair and modernize this city with all deliberate speed, and, to say, and at the same time to satisfy the federal mandate that inexpensive materials be used and that the unemployed be hired as construction workers, not necessarily skilled laborers. And Lewis Mumford recognized all that was achieved when he invented this capacious term sound vernacular modern architecture to praise the results in New York City. He alluded to the freedom of, of expression that New Dealers insisted as part and parcel of our democracy. The government didn't demand that architects use a specific style. Authoritarian regimes may have done so, may have mandated that in other parts of the world, but not in the United States where pluralism was preferred. As Sarah Fishko said on NPR this morning, when you can't see ahead, you look back. New Deal New York helps us to look back, to remember what New Yorkers accomplished in the face of the greatest challenge to our democracy, and to grasp, and it helps us to grasp what we can do, what we must do, as we face them once again. Thank you. The last of our panelists is Ira Katz Nelson, the Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History at Columbia, and also President of the Social Science Research Council. Ira? Well, how wonderful to be here. Um, this, is, this is personal for me for um, three reasons. Um, first is institutional. Um, the, I've had a very modest uh, role um, in both uh, Living New Deal and Roosevelt House advisory groups, but it's, a, it's a, an enormous personal pleasure to see these two institutions uh, gathered uh, together to celebrate a remarkable achievement, truly a remarkable uh, achievement now over the past of a decade. Dick, uh, thank you so much for your leadership and for colleagues uh, working here. Uh, this is personal, too, for the people with whom I'm participating. I won't repeat all the names, um, but I'll do, I can't not say one. Um, uh, to be on the same panel with you, Bill Lippenberg, is uh, an honor I've dreamed of for some time, so thank you. And, and finally, um, uh, this is personal for the, for the places, um, of, uh, which include places of my... Um, of, of my life and childhood, I, I managed to pitch on Randall's Island in a, <laughs> once a, a, as a, a in a teenage uh, Sandlot league. Um, I first heard um, a classical music um, in uh, I grew up in Brooklyn at Flatbush and in, in in Brooklyn College. Um, in as a teenager, when my parents insisted I go against, I said it's a girls' thing, um, <laughs> but they insisted, and they I loved it ever since. Um, uh, you know, I could go on a list of places, um, uh, just showing off my uh, once athleticism. I played basketball in Franklin Lane High School. Um, so I could go on. This is deeply um, uh, personal. Of course, I had no clue at ages of 
15 or 17 or what have you. But it was my grandmother when I was eight who first introduced me to the New Deal. Some of you know this story. Um, uh, it's my first political memory. I was uh, visiting with my parents, my maternal grandmother who lived in Washington Heights and northern Manhattan, and my mother said to her mother, Mama, for whom are you voting, Stevenson or Eisenhower? And she said, slamming her daily forward in the Yiddish newspaper <laughs> on the table, um, uh, I, I'm not voting. Not voting, Mama? You know. Uh, and she said, since Roosevelt, they're all pygmies. Uh, <laughs> well, frankly, if you think of uh, Eisenhower and Stevenson as pygmies, I don't know how we would characterize leadership today. <laughs> um, now, the, what, I, what I really want to do is um, really pick up on a sentence in um, Martha's uh, opening remarks to say something about the meaning of uh, the built environment constructed by the New Deal. And you'll see what I mean by meaning in a moment. And I, I, I want to begin by um, saying a few words about the, about the word fear. Um, uh, fear, of course, fear itself. Uh, the president told us not to fear fear itself. I, I like to say that he was, when he told us that it was not quite, um, we had no reason to fear fear itself, he was wrong. There was ample reason to, f to be fearful in March 4th, 1933. There were the um, dictatorships that um, claimed to be better democracies than liberal democracy. They were direct democracies. They had none of the nonsense of competing parties and uh, public assemblies and uh, conflicting newspapers and parliamentary or, co or congressional uh, uh, politics. Um, the Nazi party represented the German uh, race. The, uh, Mussolini's fascists represented the Italian people. Um, uh, Stalin's Soviet Union represented the working class directly, unmediatedly. We had a mess, uh, Western democracies. Well, um, for many people, not least, for example, the president of my university gave a speech in 1932 um, uh, in which um, uh, he said the, the dictatorships are leading the world in uh, solutions to our problems, and we democracies are not doing very well. Um, uh, the, um, uh, this is uh, when a building, the Italian Academy, was new at Columbia, a gift of more or less of Mussolini. Um, the, um, that we had that to fear, fear for the capacity and legitimacy of liberal democracy. Um, we had other things to fear, of course, the, uh, even the statement of 25% unemployment or one-third out of work understates, given the gendered structure of work in that period, something like 40% of adult Americans lived in households without a, a regular wage, without an income. Um, that's a source of fear. Um, there were other sources of fear that grew across the, the years of the New Deal, um, uh, the rise of new kinds of militarism and uh, levels of violence and so on. So um, uh, there was great reason to fear. Now fear, if you think about fear now as an analytical category, um, has a particular kind of meaning. I, I learned most about fear in reading um, great University of Chicago economist uh, Frank Knight wrote a book on risk and uncertainty in 1921, and he made the following distinction. Risk, all life's risky. Uh, if, if I cross uh, Lexington Avenue, there's some fraction of a chance I'll be hit by a car. Um, uh, if I marry today, if I, I'm happily married, half century, but if I were to marry today, I would know that there's a 50% chance that my marriage would end in divorce. That's the aggregate data. If I buy a house, I, I expect it to go up in value, but it might not. Um, we all take risks all the time, but there's two features of the word risk, ordinary risk. One of which is we believe, rightly or wrongly, we control the parameters within <coughs> which we can assess risk. We know what marriage is, we know what the odds are, we marry. And second, ordinary risk is measurable. I told you 50% of marriages won't end well. Maybe one one-hundredth or less, one-thousandth of one percent chance if I cross Lexington Avenue at a certain hour, 
I might get nicked by a car. But it's measurable. Now, the circumstances when Roosevelt came to power um, were not measurable in the same way. And this is Frank Knight's great distinction. He talks about unmeasurable anxiety leading to fear. Um, the collapse of capitalism was so profound that people didn't know where they were uh, economically. There were no models to look back on. There were no, no way to assess the risk or the duration ahead of them of that kind of emergency. That leads to fear. To look at Moscow, Berlin, and remember Hitler came to power weeks, just on January 31st, March 4th for Roosevelt, just weeks apart. Um, less distance between those two events, Hitler and Roosevelt, uh, coming to power uh, officially um, than the election of Donald Trump and today. Um, this was pretty vibrant stuff, the new Nazi regime. Uh, a, a great source of a challenge and fear. I could go on, but I won't. They, um, about fear, but fear, but analytically, besides that, fear has two effects. It changes context and it changes motivation. Uh, it changes context because without the parameters, um, we don't know how to assess the status quo, which meant at the time that no, I'll say this even as strongly as I can, no existing regimen of public policy was persuasive. That is, we had progressive era models, we had World War I models, we had Hoover administration models, uh, all of which offered real promise to the New Deal um, in different ways. But it was impossible to say that any single one of them or cluster of them would work, would be legitimate, um, would be capable. Um, well, that that's a funny kind of context to make policy in. And what happened in the library in this building um, was extraordinary because there was an attempt to invent, and in the language Bill and others used, experiment with um, a whole range of initiatives that might, just might, reduce deep uncertainty to more ordinary risk. That would create a new status quo when there was no legitimate status quo. And I think we underestimate the power of the New Deal when we don't realize that. Second thing uh, fear does is it changes the micro dynamics of decision. Um, it changes how people make decisions. A certain urgency, we don't, have, we don't have time in conditions of fear to just reflect. You have to act, you have to think and act quickly. And the 100 days uh, did that uh, profoundly. Um, now, I'm going to run out of time, so let me just go more quickly and simply say this is where the power, and I'm going to come back to the built environment in my conclusion. The, there was one great temptation in the early New Deal that was resisted. Walter Lippmann wrote column after column in uh, February 1933 uh, saying, uh, Franklin, um, uh, time is such, fear is such, that um, uncertainty is such, he recommended suspending the two houses of Congress for as much as a year um, and put legislation in the hands of a party caucus, not the ordinary procedures of the Hill. This is the most important journalist and hardly a left winger either in, um, uh, in American life recommending that. And at the end of President Roosevelt's first inaugural, he does say, um, I'll paraphrase now, that if I'm going to ask Congress to do A, B, and C, and if they don't, I will then ask for the capacity to rule by executive authority. Um, the greatest triumph of the New Deal is that never happened. Never happened. Didn't happen in the 100 days. And with all the celebration of public works, this is my one orthogonal uh, remark, in NRA, for example, which has public works provisions, the President of the United States did not want those public works provisions at that moment. He was a pretty fiscally conservative guy in um, the spring of 1933. Um, and Congress insisted on inserting public works in NRA. And then Roosevelt became a, a leading uh, advocate of public works and as a way to fight employment. But the great triumph was the restoration, the return from 
um, deep uncertainty and fear to ordinary risk came about through the normal procedures of constitutional liberal democracy. Uh, Congress was never suspended. Uh, Congress often caused grief to the president. Think of court packing de debates or what have you. Um, and that is the great triumph. So each of the spaces where I got to pitch or play basketball or hear a concert, um, each of those spaces was the product of ordinary democratic politics under conditions of fear. And that's an astonishing achievement. Um, that is an achievement even greater than the spaces themselves and their democratizing impact. It's a, greater, it's, it's a great achievement because every single one of those spaces contradicted the argument that only dictatorial democracies, as opposed to, they claimed they were democracies, those dictatorships, only dictatorships could solve problems legitimately and capably and not liberal democracy. And every time you see the post office, you look at the mural, you go on a ball field, you swim in the pool, remember the triumph of liberal democracy. Thank you. So this is the point at which I'm somehow supposed to tie all these together and come up with the perfectly incisive question. Um, these were just uh, really um, terrific presentations, each in very different ways. So what I want to say is this. What I see is a common thread here, and then I have two, uh, two questions that range from the, uh, the, the meta to the mundane, um, because we're interested in both here. Um, I, I see the common thread here is that this map and the Living New Deal project gives us entree into the, the, the physical legacy of the New Deal. Uh, but those physical legacies themselves are each of those projects and the agglomeration of them that we see on the map are, are really uh, a way for us to access the cultural and civic legacies of the New Deal. So that the way the New Deal is living all around us today is not just the things that were built, but uh, the, these cultural uh, elements and the and the civic elements, and of course, the political legacy. And the politi political legacy is the piece that I posited earlier has been most often misconstructed, misconstrued, or misused. And I think that we uh, heard, especially in Ira here in this last set of comments, um, a great uh, 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 set of uh, thoughts to ask us to reconsider that. But I, I want to connect it to Bill Luchtenberg's story about going to Moscow. Because I find it fascinating that that was seen as a potential middle ground uh, of some kind between state-managed socialism and state-managed capitalism. Because what I've come to realize, especially after 2007 and what we wrestled with then, that in a lot of ways, the notion of the New Deal and the scope and scale of government activity that it represents. And so this is a question directed at, at the, the two historian political scientists, and I've got another question for the two of you. Is It strikes me that in some ways, uh, even though the bugaboo in the current construct that's gone on for a couple decades now is that the New Deal and government activity is anti-capitalist, it seems really clear, based on the things we've heard today, that the New Deal and government activity, and of course this is one of the things, hopefully, I think all the teachers here and bring it into class, is that uh, the New Deal and government activity of many types is what can save capitalism from itself. And I think that that construct is missing in today's political debates. Uh, and it's, it, it's so essentially vibrant as we hear this conversation. So I'm wondering how that connects to your Moscow story. And, and I, Bill and Ira, I want to ask you about that, that notion of the ability to sustain capitalism requires government activity on the scale and of the types that we saw during the New Deal. Um, and then, so that's the meta. And for, um, for Dick, digging into, and, and Marta, digging into the details of the specific projects and putting together the map, 
Dick, I really want to ask you, as you went put together this whole project and did this somewhere in there, I know you're trained as a geographer, there's an embedded geography to these projects. And um, they can get, we can see on the New York map, so I'm wondering if there was one that was apparent to you on the New York map, but nationally, in terms of regional differences and types of projects, how this legacy that we're talking about, how the, the Living New Deal is different in different places, what the spatial dimension of it is. And Marta, you might want to comment on that. I'd also, if either one of you has like the most surprising New Deal project that you've come across that you want to call our attention to that's not one of the 30 on the map. So why don't we start with that and each give each of you um, perhaps starting, we'll just go down the line, starting with Marta and work our way down, give each of you a chance to respond to those thoughts and then we'll, uh, we'll see where that goes. If you want to respond to each other's comments, that's also fair game and then we'll get to the audience. So actually, who wants to go first here? Bill, why don't you start since you spoke first? Uh, well, uh, I was struck by uh, what Ira was saying about uh, fear. One of the uh, one of the thoughts that I try to uh, con have tried to convey to my students is that the one thing we know about the Great Depression is that it ended. But when we were living through the Great Depression, we did not know it was going to end. I've talk about the graduating class of 1929, which appeared to have the brightest prospects of almost any graduating class in our history after a year after year of uh, prosperity, but that many in that class would find no work in 1929, 1930, 1931, 1932. The first year of peacetime full employment would be in 1946, at which point the members of that graduating class of 1929 would be about 36 years old, those who survived the war. So this is uh, uh, a time of, of, of fear that carries on through uh, lifetimes of the people there and I talk about the graduating class, but for those who uh, were older, uh, the age of being uh, too old to be regarded as employable kept dropping <coughs> from 70 to 65 to 60 to 50 to 40. These are very, very scary times. I would like to uh, relate uh, Ira's uh, insight into one other thought, that a number of occasions I have lectured about the New Deal in Italy, uh, in Rome and Florence, in Bologna, uh, in Torino, And the Italians are always puzzled, try to find the answer is, how did we get Roosevelt and they got Mussolini? <laughs> uh, and I remember one occasion uh, where uh, the United States ambassador to Italy was in the audience when I spoke, a man I, I, I knew, uh, and he was sitting next to uh, a wonderful young Italian historian, Elena Agarossi. And I was talking about the kinds of achievements that are celebrated in the map. Uh, and uh, the ambassador came up to me afterwards 
and uh, he said, uh, Bill, uh, this Professor Algarossi uh, was saying each time I mentioned the New Deal achievement, the Duce did that, the Duce did that, uh, and there were, of course, uh, important public works under Mussolini and, uh, uh, and under Hitler, under Stalin. Uh, but there's a difference, and this is the key point of Ira's uh, uh, remarks, that of the way in which uh, the New Deal created uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the innovations of the of of the 1930s. There were actually all kinds of expansions of democracy rather than restrictions. So that, for example, uh, black sharecroppers who could not vote in the southern states were able to vote in AAA referenda. Uh, and this is just one example of a number of ways that the New Deal uh, built into uh, its programs uh, protections for, uh, for, for a civil society. Uh, and it is not merely the artifacts of the New Deal uh, that we celebrate the triborough bridges and the rest, but the way in which the government was able to quell fear and give a sense of national pride in what the national government was doing. In, uh, in 1944, um, Hungarian emigre Karl Polanyi published a book, many of you will know, called The Great Transformation. And there were two features of that book that bear on Owen's question that I'd like to um, take note of. Um, first was simply a, a linguistic. Writing in 1944, um, Polanyi said the world had three and only three options. He called them fascism, communism, and the New Deal. Um, but that, the, in the, uh, it wasn't, he didn't say fascism um, uh, or uh, communism or democracy or capitalism. He said the New Deal. And it was the New Deal because the New Deal had managed a particular kind of felicitous fusion of um, democracy and uh, a market, kind of market, political economy, albeit one that was now regulated, um, in some ways confined, and in some ways advantaged and advanced through uh, public policy imagination. And that was the only available option, uh, he said, the world had other than the other two. But second, Polanyi had a profound cautionary word, including for those of us who broadly would self-define as, as I would as a kind of social democrat. Um, uh, he said, writing about the 1920s, that um, social democratic policies had run the following risk of intervening just enough in the marketplace to make markets not function and not enough to create social justice. Um, so that the, the game of government market relations doesn't itself carry um, clear or uh, linear or guaranteed positive outcomes. So the lesson is first that capitalism, take your question, Owen, um, never can thrive absent public uh, surround, regulation, uh, contract law, you name it. Um, but the manner of the policy interventions, um, we're always going to get tax law, we're always going to get regulatory regimes, 
It's the manner of the intervention uh, in tandem with markets um, that is the zone of public policy imagination. And there, the New Deal got a lot more right than it got wrong. And it was only for that reason that Polanyi could write in 1944 that the New Deal was a viable option for the world, that model, um, as opposed to the period's dictatorship. Yeah, I want to make four points about the New Deal. The first is economic. The New Deal saved capitalism in the greatest uh, crisis in modern history since the Industrial Revolution. And contrary to popular opinion written by a lot of historians and economists, the New Deal actually got us out of the Great Depression. Uh, it wasn't just World War II. The economy was growing at 10% a year, several years in the 30s, which is Chinese rates. Yeah, well, I don't think it got quite that high, but we can quibble. And We're the, not gonna get the big problem was tonight, unemployment, though. but it came down from 25% to 10%, and that's been underestimated for years because of fallacious uh, statistics by Stanley Labor Guy that were done back in the 1950s. So. The New Deal actually, economically, was a huge success. But secondly, I want to speak to Owen's question, geographically. And this speaks to our time. The New Deal was everywhere. They built this stuff everywhere. And it wasn't just building projects, it was service projects as well. So uh, teaching kids, working in libraries, and so on. It isn't just stuff. It's putting people to work in useful work. And this was in all the small towns. You drive, I was just driving recently through Utah, and every small town has a New Deal post office, a New Deal auditorium, a New Deal courthouse, a New Deal airport, something from the New Deal. And it's clear, it's actually clearer in small towns many of which have never had anything so good happen to them since. And we know the decline, and we know that that has something to do with Donald Trump's victory, that there's an awful lot of places in America that have been devastated, that are hurting just as they were in the 1930s, and what they need, you know, you can have statistics that say we have full employment now, but the fact is a lot of the country is doing very badly, and you need a new deal to go into every corner of this country, and they shared. This is interesting, the feds just didn't do this. They went to every local government and every state government, said, what do you want? And then did it. The third point I want to make is about eth ethics. And Gray Brecken taught me this. The New Deal was an ethical project. It was about the public good. It, these are public buildings. They're building schools, they're building libraries, they're building museums. It's all for the public. And it's based on an idea that everyone should participate in making these and everyone should use them. And it was, you know, it was also modernization. It brought to the backward parts of the country that had not had these kinds of things, it brought a whole new standard of living. So the great American post-war miracle, the golden age, is based on this being generalized around the country. And the fourth point I want to make is it was beautiful. That they employed artists to beautify things. And the workers, who we don't remember, sometimes we remember the muralists, but these were skilled, unemployed, skilled workers uh, in many, many cases who built the most beautiful rock walls, the most beautiful trails, the most beautiful structures. These designers that Amarda was talking about, the designers of the parks, you know, everything was done with an eye to beauty. And that, in some ways, is an extraordinary legacy quite on its own. Marta? So I, I would, um, it's hard to disagree with, with Ira's statement about the enduring legacy of, the enduring political legacy of the New Deal, but I want to push back on the built environment a bit because I think that for the, and I didn't live through the New Deal, but I too use, grew up using New Deal. I had a whole piece of my talk in which I talked about learning to swim in a story of pool. And 
held by my dad, whatever. It, it, they're enduring old and enduring memories, uh, uh, for sure. But I would, I would, um, so I didn't live through this period, for sure. But I, I think in the work that I've done uh, as a historian looking at it, and is that I think that the construction of this public landscape was incredibly important, uh, and incredibly important to New Yorkers, to everyday New Yorkers who fought, fought for projects to be built in their neighborhoods, uh, who, the Pools Project was originally one that consisted of 23 projects. It was cut back for various reasons. People in Brooklynites, uh, wrote to Moses and wrote to LaGuardia demanding that more pools be built in their neighborhood. Uh, there were uh, battles in Harlem about the construction of pools in Har of a pool in Harlem, about the construction of, of Harlem River houses. And, and so I don't, I don't want as we, I want to be sure that as we assess this, this program that we not forget how much it mattered that this program was physical, uh, uh, that this program constructed space uh, and produced space in, in every dimension, in the social, the physical, uh, and the symbolic. So that's one point I want to make. Um, one point, I, 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 believe it, I believe it's very, very important uh, uh, that the physical world just not be understood as a, the background against which social and political action happens, because it's not really how politics happens, I believe. So that would be point number one. When Owen asked me what, asked what's the most amazing artifact you found, so uh, I think the most amazing artifact I found is a drawing. Uh, um, and that, the Parks Department archive uh, in the Olmsted Center in, in um, Cortona Park, which is a New Deal park, uh, the, the archive actually can, the archive is a working archive. The drawings in the park are the drawings that New Deal landscape architects and architects made. And so when you go doing, do archival research, if you're an architectural star, you like to look at drawings. So I did, and I went to the Parks Department. I was particularly interested in the mechanical systems of Thomas Jefferson Pool. And I learned a lot by looking at those drawings, for sure. But I don't, but what stuck, struck me in looking at the drawings was to see the names of the people who worked on the build, on the project. Um, and you can see all the names of the people in the hierarchy who reported to Moses, but you can also see the names of people with Polish last names, with Czech last names, with, with coming from every ethnicity that makes up New York. And those were the people who were making the drawings, who were making the projects possible. And that has stuck with me, right, stuck with me, and, and really, in no other way, in no other view uh, that I've seen do I, did, I, did I understand how deeply and profoundly this project affected New Yorkers in the mo from the most ordinary walks of life. Uh, um, and so I, and then I would say the third artifact, or the third most, two more, one, one more. They're, these are not in any particular one. order. Another, another, another uh, drawing. Another is the are the photographs that were taken of Colonial Park Pool when Colonial Park Pool, which is now Jackie Robinson Pool, was constructed, and we can see that African Americans are working on the construction site. Right against every preconception of what happened in this period, and so we have ways in which, um, in ways ways in which ways in which this 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 largesse that came to New York made New York a different a different place. Uh, uh, and then I think the, the fourth piece, and this is really evident in your map, because so many, the map you put together, Dick, because so many of the sites uh, are are made for kids, right? And 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 you I started to make a list, right, of all of them, of the zoos, of the playgrounds, of the recreation centers, of the parks, of the health centers, of the High schools, uh, and and so what what happened here in New York was that children were understood to have public lives and public lives that the government needed to invest in, uh, um, and that the need the government needed to create a landscape that would 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 help 
would help kids uh, and would, would create and treat, would understand children and teenagers and the like as having citizenship rights that were not really uh, understood otherwise previously. So I have much more I could talk about, but other people may um, I, I, As can happen when you get four brilliant people in a big topic, we've gone over time. So we, there will be Q&A, but it's going to have to be at the reception afterwards. I encourage you, but before you leave, I just have uh, closing remarks. But if you have questions, please seek out our four brilliant uh, panelists at the reception. So very quickly, four takeaways, but I'm gonna, they're gonna be one sentence each um, from this. One is, um, it's incumbent upon all of us who've heard this kind of conversation to go out and make sure that we don't allow the monochromatic discourse about the legacy of the New Deal. It's so many things and it's been reduced in so many ways. Two, use the map and tell people about it. Three, use the website and tell people about it. And four, tell people about Roosevelt House because we do things like this. Thank you very much.